Hi everyone, this is my presentation based on my conducting growth over this past year. So throughout my junior year of undergrad, I have been in two conducting courses. The first one was with Professor Stephen Squires, and we focused mostly on some basic conducting patterns and techniques in small excerpts uh, with our hands and then with the baton. And then this past semester, I've been in my second conducting class with Emanuele Andrizzi, and here we have done much more expanding on these ideas by recording rehearsals, going to various different observations that I'm going to talk about, applying this to our conducting technique in general, and then choosing repertoire. So I'm going to be sharing that with you today. First up are the observations. First, I observed the Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra, so the CYSO, their top level. Um, I observed three different rehearsals over three weeks. So they have weekly rehearsals every Sunday for three hours, and I got to see how they progressed and what they worked on throughout these three weeks. So they are around ages 14 through 18 for the kids, but there are a couple that are younger. And this was conducted by Maestro Alan Tinkham, and it is his 22nd season at CYSO. And I also want to include this quote that he mentioned of him during the rehearsal, saying that tuning is the defining line between everything else in your life and rehearsal. And I think the kids really took an important notice to that. And below I mentioned some of the repertoire that they had been rehearsing for their upcoming concert. So what I learned from these three observations was the usage of music theory and analysis. So he made it a priority to talk about the French tempo terms, and he also reinforces and reminds them of what these terms mean in the following rehearsals. He's also very important about spelling chords and discussing the function of the chords. So these kids are definitely getting a lot of music theory and music history knowledge in while they're playing, which I think is very important in these youth ensembles. Secondly, his conducting. He uses lots of hand independence, and he really leans a lot, does all these cues with his left hand, but also maintains his right hand, keeping it nice and steady. He also tends to sing with them or just mouth the words, kind of like a choir director would do. And his conducting is very lyrical. When he's getting to lyrical parts and really beautiful melodies, he will really conduct from the wrist and leans around to show with his body language and with his face what he's looking for. And third were the rehearsal techniques. He encourages focus with the defining line between before, during, and after rehearsal. And this kind of goes back to that tuning quote that I mentioned a slide earlier. He also chooses a theme generally for the overall rehearsal. Now he didn't say this, but I got this idea based on watching these consecutive rehearsals. He also works on one section, really detailed, and then he'll go back and put everything all together. But he really does get super into detail before putting everything together. Afterwards, I have these four iconic questions that I ask. So first was challenges of teaching student groups. And he said what's mostly difficult is the focus to get the kids to get this really deep level of focus, especially for details, and to get them to be doing compelling music making. It takes a lot out of the kids. And I asked about some rehearsal planning. He says that he doesn't do every single minute detail of what they're going to do, but he has general ideas. He makes sure that he's always paying attention to how long it's been since everyone's played, because if you're a brass player sitting in the back and it's been like 25 minutes since you played, your focus is not going to be where it needs to be. And you're also gonna feel pretty left out like you don't really matter in the rehearsal. He makes sure that he addresses individually every section at some point throughout the rehearsal, and he prioritizes starting with high-level intonation. At the beginning, is very on intonation, and then they can work on other parts. And he talks about turning the hardest places, the weaknesses, into strengths. I asked if they do any readings at CYSO, and he just said that he hates trying to make music when everyone is so buried into their parts, which I can very much so understand. And I also asked if they do sectionals, and he said that they do 90-minute individual sectionals with guests. Now, going on to my second observation at Jones College Prep, their intermediate band. So the band has about 15 to 20 kids, and this is their middle-level band. And it consists of kids ages 14 through 18, conducted by Michael Block, who went to Eastern Illinois University for jazz saxophone. And he's been at Jones for around 10 years. 
And I also listed repertoire below. They just did a couple pop songs and used power warm-ups. So what I learned from this observation, I like how he incorporates the marching band warm-ups during the year as part of their repertoire. As in terms of his conducting, I was kind of surprised to see how he was a little more slumped in his chair and didn't really portray much energy that I think the conductor should have, uh, not really smiling or modeling with confidence for the students. And then for rehearsal techniques, I love that he uses this big tuner and metronome app on the big screen. So when the students are tuning and pulling out and in, they can actually watch the visual of if they're in tune or not. He also lets them choose the next song that they go to, so advocating for student choice there. And I was pretty surprised that class started, they actually started playing around 8.18, but class began at 8 o'clock. And I think it's very important to use your rehearsal time very valuably in making sure that you start right when class begins. Now they have to assemble their instruments, of course, but I would hope it would take less than 18 minutes. Now going to my four iconic questions, uh, challenges of teaching student groups. He said is the dedication factor, right? So they're so busy with homework and they wanna be with their friends. And this also goes into what he talked about with practice culture, um, getting them to practice and to be dedicated to their instruments while maintaining all these other parts of their life. He also mentioned the challenge about being on task at 8 a.m., which I just talked about. And he says that posture tends to be a big thing. He doesn't like to have to talk about posture a lot, but he tends to have to, especially with these classes that are so early for the kids. I asked about rehearsal planning, and he says for the intermediate band, they actually have no concerts until May, which was a huge shock to me. I would hope that for my classes that they could have more consecutive concerts so they could always be working towards something, not something so far away. Um, so that's something to take away is advocating for my students and their performances. Um, and he also says that he likes to have a big picture focus of his rehearsal plan. So kind of like Maestro Tinkham, not doing every minute detail. And he also prioritizes and includes technique in their methods books. I asked about readings and sectionals, and he said that they don't do either. And finally, my third observation that I'd done was the Roosevelt University course. So this is college level, 18 and older, um, but they're about mostly 18 and 19 year olds in this group. And there were 21 total plus one pianist. And this was led by Mark Creighton, who is a vocalist, conductor, and teacher. So in rehearsal, they did standing stretches, they did warm-ups, um, sight reading, and then they did their concert run-through because they have a concert exactly a week after I did this observation. Going into what I learned was the multi-focused warm-up because I was in choir in high school for one year. Otherwise, I don't have much training in choir. So I really liked getting into some of these warm-ups and how he really made use of their time. So they had their hands on their rib cage so they could feel their breathing. They started in C major and were raising the keys by half steps, singing ooh. But they also included staccato and legato in this one exercise, like ooh, 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 ooh. And I think that's really cool how he incorporates all these things but he also did an increase in tempo. So as they were doing the ooh, 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 like that. And so it was just really amazing how there are all these elements in there that were going on at the same time. And then for his conducting, he's very particular in showing the consonants with his left hand, which is of course important in choir. And I really liked how he showed the bouncy light style that they were conducting in their piece, right? Um, but it was shown in his facial expressions and also his baton. He also really keeps his elbows away from his body, which is a bad habit of mine when I'm conducting, so I really took notice into that. And he always sings with them or mouths the words when he's cueing particular parts that are difficult. And then rehearsal techniques, he makes sure to stretch the whole body, right? So they're not just stretching kind of like up here closer to where you feel that the voice is, right? You think the voice is here, but really your whole body needs to be ready because your whole body is your instrument. For breathing exercises, he said, you can't sing a four measure phrase if you can't hiss for 40 seconds. So they did a 40 second And it was really interesting seeing them all try to get this really long hiss and being vocalist and having this powerful uh, diaphragm and with the breathing it was really great. And he also enforces particular focus with blending and absorbing other sound. 
and then talked a lot about posture, keeping the music just below your mouth, but not all the way down here and not covering your face. And then finally, my questions, challenges of teaching student groups. He said these are mostly 18 and 19 year olds, so their technique is not as far. So he makes sure that they are always singing with technique and was consistently reinforcing this in the rehearsal. For rehearsal planning, he likes to think backwards. So he imagines that the last two weeks should be run-throughs and polishing before their concert. Otherwise, it's about 15 minute modules of specific parts of the piece. So he gets a little more detailed in his rehearsal planning. Um, and he said 15 minutes is about four pages if they know the music pretty well. And he also talked about the importance of everyone singing everyone's part when they're rehearsing particular parts, that it really has helped their intonation. I asked about readings, and this is only done in choral methods class, not in rehearsal. So I think another great thing to what we learned in the CYSO, that when you're buried in your part, they aren't really that important in the rehearsal space. And then sectionals, he said that this was their first year that sectionals weren't needed anymore when they were singing each other's parts. It's helped their intonation and their knowledge just of the piece in general. And finally, my rehearsal recording. So this was of the Chicago College of Performing Arts Symphony Orchestra. I was actually a part of this concert cycle in this orchestra. So the first rehearsal date was January 17th with Emanuele Andrizzi. We started with two out of the four pieces in this first rehearsal, and some of the techniques that I wrote down when I listened back to this recording was, first, we talked about why we still perform Wagner and kind of got into the background stories of like West Side Story. So very important things to talk about before playing these pieces and before the rehearsal even began. Um, we also played through West Side Story and Wagner all the way through, but we stopped to discuss these big picture ideas of the tempos, the tempo changes, the conducting patterns that he would be showing. So we generally knew what to look for and it helped us get together in the ensemble before we worked on polishing things. And secondly, this was our final rehearsal, just two days before our concert, January 31st. And this time we got to all four of our pieces and throughout the rehearsal, we would fix a few spots first and then we would run the piece. And we did this in order of the concert. He talked about dynamics in relation to the structure of the piece and resolutions, so much more detail focused. And also the percussive style theme. So the theme of the timpani when it was in the brass, he wanted to get that style out of the brass section too. Again, really detailed focus now that we're getting close to the concert. And we also focused on the opening in Respiki, where if you know this piece, you know the seconds, the second violins open up this part and they have to keep a nice consistent tempo and really be watching the conductor and you have to conduct very clearly here. Now, taking all of this, my three observations of the band, orchestra, and choir at all these different levels with all these different people and these different interviews and these different rehearsals that I was a part of or just observing, now I apply this to the repertoire that I've chose throughout the semester for middle school and high school. First is middle school orchestra. So I chose this piece, Spartacus, by Brian Volmages. It's fairly simple. I like how it sounds difficult, but it's really not that difficult. It, it's just very exciting. And there is a big important tempo change that is great for students to get used to feeling the difference in tempo and then of course conducting. And the violin, cello, and bass have these sporadic eighth notes that come in uh, later on where they really have to be counting and watching the conductor. So I went back and I got this idea from Maestro Tinkham um, of having a theme for rehearsal. And I know that one of my rehearsals in this pieces would really be dedicated to the character changes. Um, you can see in the top photo that I have over here, it's going from these quarter notes that are really heavy in the lower section, the bum, 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 bum. And then all of a sudden it's lyrical. Da, dee, 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 dum. Dun, dun, dun. So this is a new change here. And this happens pretty consistently throughout the piece, these changes. So I would dedicate a theme to one of my rehearsals. And then secondly, I got this idea for the second part of the score below from Maestro Andrizzi, making sure I discuss the tempo changes. So just like he did early on in our first rehearsal, this would be earlier on with my students, I'd be clarifying the tempo changes because at the beginning, we're at 72 for the quarter note. But at this tempo change, it is at 144, so much faster. 
Now we're going on to high school orchestra. So here I chose Geometric Dances by Richard Meyer. This piece has three movements total and just has so many new techniques for students with phrasing and faster bow lifts, shifting between first and third positions, glissandos, and glissandos into harmonics too. And there's also a coda and DS, so I can explain these terms to the students who may not know of them. And there's also a great chance for the strings to be playing with percussion because here it involves the maracas and the triangle. So going back to this from Maestro Andrizzi, at first rehearsal, we discussed Bernstein's West Side Story. And I think I would make this a priority for sure in the square, round, and triangle dance. So these are the movements and really clarifying why they're called these shapes and how those shapes create these characteristics that we want to show in our playing. So this would be a very important discussion I would also have with my students. And I allow the students to kind of talk out and share how they feel about this and how they think they're bringing out these shapes types of styles. So in my first uh, part of the score up here in 2-4, it shows how this time and being with these square 16th notes create that effect for the square movement. And then next to it, we're in three, four for the round dance. And it kind of feels like we're in one. So it's like this circular feel that I'm almost kind of doing with my baton too, that I talked to the students about. And then the one below it is the third movement. So the triangle dance. And this one is in three, but it's kind of switching between two and three. So this kind of uneven style, almost like the triangle being uneven. So again, we can talk about this. And of course the triangle dance because there's a triangle in it. <laughs> And also from Maestro Creighton, I have this idea of playing and or clapping the cello and bass part. So not just the cellos and basses clapping it because it's their part, but also incorporating the violins and violas and even the percussion to practice clapping this part because it's so important and it really creates this idea of the back and forth between two and three. And I think if all sections knew this, just how in the choir they all practice each other's parts, it would really help the overall ensemble. So with the bum, 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 or the, and three, bum, 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 and then the bum, bum, with the three here. And this is shown in the score below. Going forward to middle school band, I picked 49er Spirit by Gary Gilroy, and this is for concert band. So it has a lot of this call and response idea, so really provoke listening in the students. And generally it has very simple rhythms, the range isn't too bad, and it's pretty repetitive, so not too tricky. These ideas were directly pulled from Maestro Tinkham, Maestro Creighton, and Block about hand independence for the triangle cues and then the dynamics. So you can see in this first part I show highlighted where the triangle plays and then the other sections play. So you really have to keep this steady here while cueing each of these sections back and forth. And when we have the dynamic changes, which is right below too, this goes into my third point, I also have to really show these crescendos going up really evenly and then down really evenly while keeping the tempo here. And then technique for the mezzo piano, I can really focus on this in all of the parts that have this mezzo piano more lyrical section here. So kind of like how Maestro Creighton was talking about prioritizing technique, I would have to talk about blowing less air, but having a really good tone for the mezzo piano. And going on to high school band. So this is Havana Nights and it's for wind ensemble. This idea is from Maestro Tinkham about defining terms, right? So I'd make sure that I define the first term, which is mambo. And this also goes into my next point about how Maestro Andrizzi explained the Bernstein West Side Story. So I'd want to connect how the mambo, because it's a Cuban dance tempo, relates to the title of the piece and the meaning, Havana Nights, which Havana is the capital of Cuba. So very important connecting this tempo term to the title and then the overall meaning of the piece. And then going into what Maestro Block talked about, this is a longer piece, so it's six minutes. Um, and has some longer lines. So I'd wanna encourage posture, like he talked about, for better breathing technique. Finally, going on to choir. So this is middle school choir, and I chose The Old Mill by Kenneth Riggs. This is in three parts for soprano, alto, and bass, and of course, piano. Here they have two types of fermatas. So there's a fermata with a cutoff, and then there's one that's a continuous retrace. 
Also, cues and independent entrances happen pretty wildly in this piece. So that hand independence really comes out here. Now, these ideas from Maestro Creighton about singing each other's parts to understand the first entrances in relation to the first bass entrance here. So you can see in my score right here where I wrote Q, I want to keep my left hand free during that last measure of the piano part to cue the basses in. And the basses go on for about eight measures here and getting used to when the soprano is coming after them and when the alto is coming after them. And we're working on this, I'd probably want the sopranos and altos to sing the bass part, probably a, up an octave, but to get used to understanding and correlation where they come in and if their parts are kind of similar. And then for the conductor, I want to make sure that I'm cueing and also mouthing, maybe singing, maybe not singing, um, the entrance with the altos in this next part of the score below. Because as you can see, the sopranos and bass come in together on an offbeat, but the altos come in at a totally separate time, singing the same words on a different offbeat. So I have a feeling that would be a difficult cue for the altos, and that's something I might want to mouth with them so they have a little more confidence going into their part there. And finally, high school choir. I chose Sisi Nimoya, and this is for three parts as well. So soprano, alto, and bass. But there's also a descant part, a drum part, and the piano. So here, there is lots and lots of cueing. It is so important that the students and the conductor know their part really well. There's also a time change that goes from 2-4 four to 4-4. Four, four. And here I got some ideas that I would do these rehearsals from Maestro Creighton. So I'd probably want to practice in rounds. Now, they may or may not have had that practice of doing rounds in their general music elementary education. So I definitely want to prioritize doing rounds. Probably with, I could create something with these words and with a similar style, or we can do rounds of uh, something completely different, like a round warm up. Also, another idea of a warm up, I would want to start in C major, just like Maestro Creighton did, and raise the keys by half step, but not singing on ooh. I would want to sing on hey, because here it's really easy to get that hey instead of hey here with the mouth. And this hey ya, hey ya comes in on all these different parts. So that's a great way to incorporate this piece into the warm up as well. And then, of course, I would want to continually reinforce singing with technique from this warm up as well. Um, and then, here in my second part of the score, we can see how the round part is so important, where it says, we all bruise, and then altos come in, we all bruise, and sopranos come in, we all scar, and it keeps going this round like kind of. Feel. And I want to make sure that the students understand this and are comfortable with it. So warming up with rounds is also very important for this piece. And that is my presentation on my conducting growth throughout my junior year of undergrad so far. So if you have any questions, you can comment them below or you can send me an email and I would be happy to talk about this more and answer your questions. Thank you.